Hello and welcome to this FMSP online revision recording for the OCR specification module M2 mechanics and this topic is coefficient of restitution and impulse. Under that heading in the specification we see three sections. The first refers to Newton's experimental law. That's the one that says the speed of separation equals e times the speed of approach, where e is the coefficient of restitution. And there's some reminders about the values of e. The second point is we need to be able to use Newton's experimental law in the course of solving problems that may be modelled as the direct impact of two smooth spheres, or perhaps the direct impact of one smooth sphere with a fixed plane. In other words, rebounding off a wall or bouncing off the floor. And then the third point is the definition of impulse. Impulse is change in momentum. And although it says here in one dimension only, don't forget that momentum is a vector quantity and has a direction. If we specify, as I normally do, to the right as being my positive direction, then anything moving to the left will have a negative velocity and therefore a negative momentum or a positive momentum if it's moving to the right. So here's a reminder of some key points. The first one is this lovely fact that momentum is conserved. Total momentum before the collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. It almost seems unbelievable. You think something ought to be lost. Well, energy may be lost. Now Newton's experimental law. And if you think of it like this, if you take the speed of approach and multiply it by e to get the separation speed, what would that mean if e was equal to 1? Well, it means the speed of separation would be exactly the same as the speed of approach, like a perfect rebound with no loss of speed. On the other hand, if e was equal to 0, then it doesn't matter what your approach speed would be multiply by zero and the separation speed is zero. That's like throwing a bean bag against a wall. Doesn't matter how hard you throw it, it's not going to rebound. Then we have our definitions of impulse. In particular change in momentum which I take as momentum afterwards minus the momentum before. And be careful with the minus sign and don't forget about the possible directions if you've specified which to take as your positive direction, anything going the other way has a negative momentum. So you might be subtracting a negative. Now let's do a couple of examination questions. And here's the first one. And as always, I'm going to draw a picture to illustrate it. Here's the floor and a small sphere of mass 0.2 kilograms. is dropped from rest. Now it's going to go straight down and hit the floor. Initially it's at rest. And that's a height of 3 meters to the ground. It falls vertically, hits the ground and rebounds. For convenience I'm going to draw that out to the side here, to the right. So it's going to bounce up and we're told it rebounds to 1.8 meters. So, here's my situation, and what have I got to do with it? Calculate the magnitude of the impulse which the ground exerts on the sphere. Well, that means I want change in momentum. So, first of all, I'm going to define a positive direction, which I think upwards makes sense to take as positive for this question. And I'm going to need to know the speed when this ball hits the ground, and the speed when it bounces back up again. And for convenience I'm just going to label uh, A as its position when it's dropped from rest, B when it hits the ground with a speed which I'm going to refer to as V1, and then C, not really a new position, but when the ball rebounds with a speed V2, and then by the time it's back 1.8 meters in the air, which I'm going to call D, it's once again at rest. Now, to answer part one, 
you could use the SUVAT equations because you've got enough information to do that but instead I'm going to choose to do that with energy so here we go what do we know to start with? well initially when it's at its first position the gravitational potential energy we know and we know it's kinetic energy there's no work done here either in or out of the system so I can simply say that those quantities are going to be the same at position A and at position B that is the total is going to be the same so what have we got? well to start with gravitational potential energy that is m times g times h mgh mass was 0.2 g is 9.8 you physicists remember don't take 9.81 we're instructed to use 9.8 in mechanics so that's m times g times a height of 3 meters plus well zero because the ball is dropped from rest when it hits the ground well I'm going to take the ground level as my zero level it's fairly obvious so it's got zero gravitational potential energy there but it's gained some speed and I've got half times the mass which is 0.2 times my speed which I'm going to call V1 the speed before the collision V1 squared don't forget when you do these energy equations you're going to have the mass typically cancel out so remove that from both sides before we do anything well, 3 times 9.8 is 29.4 and that's equal to half of V1 squared I doubled both sides and said V1 squared is 58.8 and therefore V1 is the square root of 58.8 because there it is in exact form I'll remember that but uh, just for mathematical interest I'll see what the speed is it's 7.67 meters per second to three significant figures and for that part of the question there's one for a method using either energy or SUVAT and one for getting a correct answer either in third form or to three significant figures for the first speed well let's carry on and see what we can do afterwards once again I'm going to use energy so immediately after the bounce with the floor, the collision with the floor I've got a new speed and I'm going to do exactly the same as before consider the potential energy plus the kinetic energy, sorry that should be C at the position on the floor immediately after the collision and when the ball has bounced up to its height of 1.8 meters and is once again at rest so what do we know? the gravitational potential energy at ground level is zero the kinetic energy is half times the mass 0.2 times and don't forget it's a different speed after it's bumped into the floor otherwise it would rise to the same height as before so I'm going to call that V2 half mv squared for my kinetic energy at that point and that's equal to the gravitational potential energy when it's risen 1.8 meters 0.2 times g 9.8 times 1.8 plus its kinetic energy when it's risen that far well it bounces up and we're, t we're told it's at rest so that's plus zero once again you can cancel 0.2 from both sides before you proceed so uh, I think what I'll do is also double both sides and say that V2 squared equals 2 times 9.8 times 1.8 and that gave me again an exact value that I want to come back to for uh, V2 squared 35.28 and therefore V2 is the square root of 35.28 and given that the square root of 36 is 6 it's going to be just a little bit less than 6 and it's 5.94 meters per second to three significant figures okay um, and just to say there's a method mark 
for the answer for V2, but there's no new... I'm sorry, there's an answer mark for 5.94 or square root of 35.28, but there's no new method mark because it is the same method, exactly the same method. OK, next thing then is we're asked to find the impulse. And the impulse is the change in momentum. And as I said earlier, that's momentum afterwards minus momentum before. So that's mass times speed v2 minus the mass times speed v1. Before I write that down, I want to return to the diagram. Because, look at v1. v1 is heading downwards but my positive direction I'm choosing is upwards. So V1 is a negative velocity, but V2 is a positive velocity. So easy to make that mistake, isn't it? So my mass, which is 0 0.2, times my velocity, which to save losing any accuracy at all, I'm going to put root of 35.28, which I know is exact, minus my mass of 0 0.2 times well don't forget V1 was heading downwards and my positive direction is upwards so it's a negative velocity there we go to save myself a little bit of calculation effort I called that 0 0.2 times 35 root of 35.28 uh, minus minus, so that's plus the square root of 58.8. And calculating that gave me an answer of 2.72. The units are newton seconds. And that's been rounded off to three significant figures. Right, that's the impulse. Now the last part of the question, part three. And I'll just go back and comment that there's one mark for the method and there's one mark for the answer here. So the last thing is let's find the value of E and I've got speed of separation equals E times speed of approach and there's Newton's experimental law. Well that means if I divide both sides by speed of approach E equals speed of separation divided by speed of approach well I know both of those in third form exactly So that's root of 35.28 over the root of 58.8. And that gives me a value of E of 0 0.775 to three significant figures. And you might notice on your calculator, as I did on mine, that in fact that comes out as an exact third. It's the square root of 15 over 5. However, the decimal answer is perfectly acceptable and once again, one mark for the method using Newton's experimental law and one mark for the answer. Right, now we're going to look at a different collisions question. Two spheres of masses 2 and 3 kilograms are going to collide directly on a smooth horizontal plane. Well every time I do a question like this I want to draw before and after diagrams to show me exactly what's going on and I very clearly define what I want to be the positive direction and I'm going to take to the right so beforehand we have two spheres two kilograms and three kilograms 
and they're heading directly towards each other. We're told the speeds are 8 and 4 meters per second respectively. Now afterwards the masses haven't changed and I always do write the masses in again so that when I write my conservation of linear momentum uh, below it's as easy as possible but I don't know the speeds. Calculate the speed and direction of motion of each sphere after the collision. Well, it's just possible that both are going to move to the right. They might rebound and both change direction. Um, possibly they might both go to the left. That seems slightly unlikely to me because the speed of the two kilogram masses is, is significantly greater. However, if you're not sure, my advice is choose velocities which are positive on the diagram. So I don't know what's going to happen, but if by chance the two rebound, V1 will come out as negative in the working, so the sign of my answers will confirm or correct my choice of direction. But I'm going to introduce less errors if I make V1 and V2 both positive at this stage. OK then. Let's see what happens first of all with conservation of linear momentum, CLM. OK, momentum before. Well, I've got a mass of 2 times a speed of 8 plus a mass of 3 times a speed of it's going in a negative direction, so it's a velocity of minus 4. And that's equal to 2 times a velocity V1 plus 3 times a velocity v2. So on the left I've got 16 take 12 equals 2v1 plus 3v2. In other words 4 equals 2v1 plus 3v2. So there's my first equation. I'll get another equation from considering the energy because we're told about the kinetic energy that's lost. So let's consider the energy of each particle, each sphere. Well it's kinetic energy because they're all on the same level and there's no work being done. So it's half mv squared in every case. Because we're squaring velocity the direction isn't going to make any difference. So for the first one half times a mass of 2 times a velocity of v squared, a velocity of 8 squared, plus half times a mass of 3 times a velocity of 4 squared. And I'm going to subtract 81, because 81 is lost before I get to my new situation. And the new situation is half times 2 times v1 squared plus half times 3 times v2 squared. And I'm going to have a second equation with the two variables v1 and v2 so I can see this is going to end up as simultaneous equations. So what's on the left? Half of 2, well that's just 1 times 8 squared, that's 64, uh, excuse me, 64 plus a half of 3 times 16 well that must be 3 times 8 that's 24 take away 81 and over here a half of 2 is 1 so that's just v1 squared plus a half of 3 um, which I'll put as 3 over 2 times v2 squared well on the left that's 88 take 81 that's just 7 and that's equal to v1 squared plus 3 over 2 v2 squared. And I think as I can see simultaneous equations looming, I'd rather have integer coefficients. So let's double everything. 14 equals 2v1 squared plus 3v2 squared. And there's my second equation. 
And before I leave this page, just a word about the marking. Because um, there's 12 marks in total, and it's not clear where they all come from. Firstly, using conservation of linear momentum is worth a method mark, and arriving at this equation is worth an answer mark. For energy, there are two method marks for this part, uh, and that's really getting um, parts, separate parts of the energy equation correct. So it's allowing for you to be using energy and maybe make one mistake and still get a method mark. So two method marks there and one answer mark again for the equation at the end. So, so far that's scored five of the twelve marks for using conservation of linear momentum and energy to write down two equations. Well, let's solve these equations then. And I'm going to write them the other way round just because we'll probably feel more comfortable with that. So we had 2v1 plus 3v2 equals 4 and that was equation 1 and 2v1 squared plus 3v2 squared equals 14 and that was my equation 2. Well, because of the squareds in the second equation I think I'm going to have to solve by substitution. It'll be easiest to rewrite equation 1 and to do that I think I'll move 3v2 to the other side so that gives me 4 minus 3v2 and therefore v1 equals a half of that now because I'm going to use that later on I'm going to call that a new name, it's still equation 1, but I'll call it equation 1 dashed for when I return to it a bit later on. So let's substitute this into equation 2 for v1. Well I get 2v1 squared so that means I'm going to get two lots of and I've got to be a bit careful here about that half because when I square v1 I'm going to get 4 minus 3v2 squared I'm going to get a half squared, so that's not going to cancel as easily as you might have thought. Now let's write the rest of equation 2. 3v2 squared equals 14. OK, well, I can multiply the 2 and cancel part of it, and I'm going to end up with 4 minus 3v2 all squared over 2. plus 3v2 squared equals 14 and I'd like to multi through, uh, multiply through by 2 so I have integers to deal with and I'm going to multiply out 4 minus 3v2 squared at the same time it's 16 minus 2 lots of 3 times 4 which is 12 so minus 24v2 plus 9v2 squared and there's still 3v2 squared there from before and that all equals 14. Now I need to multiply by um, so I'm going to leave the 2 in there I need to multiply by 2 to get rid of that fraction and I'm going to end up with 16 minus 24v squared uh, v2 plus 9v2 squared plus 6 v2 squared equals 28 and now I have it all on one line all integers and no fractions so let's get everything to the left 9 v2 squared and 6 v2 squared is 15 v2 squared then there's only the 1 v2 term minus 24 v2 and I've got 16 on the left and I'm going to subtract 28 as well so everything's on the left, so that'll end up as minus 12. Well, everything there is a multiple of 3. So I'm going to divide by 3. 5v2 squared minus 8v2 minus 4 equals naught. I'm hoping that's going to factorise. 
If it does, I'm going to have to have 5v2 in one of the brackets. And then I've either got 4 and 1, or 2 and 2, as a choice for the other end of the brackets. And it's 2 and 2, because I can arrange to get minus 8v squared from minus 2 times 5, that's minus 10, and then plus 2v2. There we go. Now I've run out of room there, so I'm going to carry on on the right hand part of the page. And that means I've got two solutions for v2. v2 equals either minus two fifths or two. Well, let's substitute those back into equation one dashed because that's already got v1 as the subject of the equation. What do I get? Well, first of all, let's take v2 is minus 2 fifths. And I'm going to get v1 equals a half of 4 minus 3 lots of minus 2 fifths. Well, that'll be a plus, won't it? So I'll have 4 plus 6 fifths and I want half of 4 plus 6 fifths which is going to be 2 plus 3 fifths there we go, there's an answer for V V1 alternatively what happens if I have V2 is 2 well then I'm going to have V1 equals a half of 4 minus 3 lots of 2 v1 equals a half of 4 takes 6, a half of minus 2, that's minus 1. Now I need to think a little bit about these solutions to see if they're both feasible. OK, let's consider first of all the possibility that I have v1 equals 2 and 3 fifths meters per second, which was when v2 was equal to minus two-fifths. I'm going to return now to the diagram and see if that makes sense if V1 is positive and V2 is negative. Well, if V1 is positive and V2 is negative after the collision, that means they're still head-on to each other. That seems unlikely. Seems more likely to me that perhaps they would rebound. So this solution here turns out not to be the correct one. The only correct one is if V1 is negative 1 meters per second. In other words, the left-hand mass is moving towards the left. And V2, the corresponding value for that, was 2 meters per second, which means V2, uh, the uh, right-hand particle, is moving to the right. That does make logical sense. So I have these two speeds, and I'll just write as a comment, therefore, both spheres reverse direction. And there we go. I hope that's been a good refresher for E, the speed of separation, equals E times the speed of approach and for use of um, conservation of linear momentum. Don't forget to check out the other OCR M2 revision videos.